Well, what we want to do in this session is build on our conference theme, which is preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I consider church history, I wanted to select one individual for us to consider during this conference who would exemplify preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, there are many selections from which we could draw, not the least of which would be Spurgeon or Whitfield, men like that. But in my mind, there was one man who especially commends himself to us for our study and consideration in this session, and it is John Knox, the trumpet blast of Scotland. And what I want to do is look at Knox as it relates to his preaching. Earlier today, we heard a very moving and soul-stirring presentation of William Tyndale and John Rogers regarding their commitment to the gospel as they ended up being martyred at the stake. And I know your soul was challenged, as mine was, as that was one of the greatest presentations I think I've ever heard from history. This will not be at that magnitude because John Knox did not die as a martyr. But I think there is much for us to learn from John Knox in his preaching as he is regarded as the father of the Scottish Reformation and as he is considered the founder of the Scottish Presbyterian and Scottish Protestant Church. Uh, John Knox was many things. He was a reformer. He was a pastor. He was an author. He was a writer of creeds and confessions. But first and foremost, John Knox was a preacher. All of the reformers were essentially preachers at heart. And if you could have taken away all of their ministries and only left them one ministry, it would not have been to sit at a desk and to write. It would have been to stand in a pulpit and to preach the Word of God. And that would be true with Martin Luther, with John Calvin. These men had a fire in their bones that had to come out publicly and verbally in the proclamation of the Word of God. And so, John Knox, he was a preacher throughout the entirety of his converted life. As soon as he was converted, and as soon as he was uh, really won to the Protestant cause, he immediately was singled out to be a preacher in St. Andrew's Castle. And he began the exposition of the Gospel of, of John. And for the rest of his life, whether he was in England, whether he was in Frankfurt, Germany, whether he was in Geneva, Switzerland, whether he was in Scotland, he was a preacher of the Word of God. Now, you have before you uh, a biographical overview of his life, and I do not want to spend my time giving you a biographical sketch of Knox because we would become very slowed down and not be able to get to his preaching. But just to give you a fly over his life, to put him in historical context, just so you can know, he was born in 1514. By comparison, it would be uh, three years later that Martin Luther would nail his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. Um, it was just uh, five years before this that John Calvin was born in 1509. So here is the historical setting in which he found, was found. He, he went to St. Andrews, the University of St. Andrews. He was a brilliant man. He, he was a man of great mental capacity and was trained at that time in the finest university of Scotland. One thing we learn about these reformers, they were all brilliantly educated men. Now, these were not the men who could not hack it in, in, in intellectual, uh, scholastic, exegetical, theological work. These men were at the head of the line in their brilliance in handling the Word of God. They had to be in order to fight the battles that they fought. And John Knox entered the ministry in perhaps the strangest way. He became the personal bodyguard of a martyr in Scotland. 
a man named George Whitsart. I, I just stood three weeks ago where John, George Whitsart was, was martyred. Dr. Ferguson was standing next to me, and there was a GW on the pavement in St. Andrews. Uh, George Whitsart was a prolific, powerful preacher of the Word of God and was, had an itinerant ministry, and for only a few months, John Knox followed him and looked up to him as a, as a mentor. And George Whitsart was in such uh, danger for his life as he preached, and in a very short time would be martyred and burned at the stake, that John Knox stepped in and carried a broad uh, a broadsword, and literally, bodily, physically, was the man who would accompany him and step in and, and defend him to, to his own death, if need be. And when they came for John, uh, George Whishart, he gave that famous line to John Knox, who was ready to die on the spot to defend George Whishart as he preached Reformed truth. Whishart said to Knox, one sacrifice is enough. Meaning, young man, you flee. Let them martyr me. You live to preach another day. That's basically how John Knox entered the ministry. He then went into the St. Andrew's Castle and began to teach through the Word of God, through the Gospel of John, and began to expound and to exposit the Scripture. And in the middle of a service, the preacher called him out by name and said, you're called into the ministry. And John Knox burst into tears and left the room, overwhelmed with a sense of the call of God and what that would mean, uh, the, the, the weightiness, the gravitas of being called into the ministry. He re eventually accepted this call that he believed was from God. And no more had he accepted it, but French ships of war sailed into the North Sea and came against St. Andrews, and they stormed the castle, and they captured John Knox and took him back to France, a prisoner of war. He was forced for the next 19 months to be an under-rower at the lowest level of a French ship that went up and down the northern sea. And as it would pass periodically St. Andrews, he could look out the hole and he could see the steeples of the church, churches in St. Andrews. And in his heart, he believed that one day God would set him free and allow him to come back to St. Andrews and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. After 19 months, a political deal was worked out between King Edward VI. We heard about him earlier. The, the teenage king of England, the Protestant king of England, worked out in a prisoner exchange with the French so that John Knox would be released. And John Knox was now a free man. He went down into England and began to preach the Word of God. He went to Berwick. And there he met his future wife from a very prominent family. And he began to, to preach the Word of God, and he so distinguished himself that news reached the king of England, of this powerful Scottish preacher in northern England, and John Knox was made one of the king's chaplains and was commissioned by the king of England to, to go throughout England and to preach the Word of God and to spread the Reformed faith as far and as wide as his lips could tell the story. And John Knox was a, was a trumpet blast even in England. And he said, I delight in blowing my master's trumpet. And that was the tone with which John Knox preached. He was a trumpet blast. Edward VI soon died, as we heard this morning. And he was succeeded by Bloody Mary. Never did a nation go from one extreme to another overnight so swiftly. And many stayed like John 
Rogers and, and fought it out and eventually were martyred in England. Others fled. John Knox was one of those who fled. It was said that he had a remarkable sense of self-preservation. He fled to France. From France he went to Geneva to counsel with John Calvin. And in the strange providence of God, God used Bloody Mary to drive John Knox to John Calvin. For John Knox to be taught and trained at the feet of John Calvin, and when Bloody Mary would be removed from the throne, John Knox would take the, the theology and the, the teaching of Scripture of John Calvin and take it to Scotland and there to establish perhaps the most reformed nation that there has ever been, Scotland. How strange are the ways of God. After being with Calvin for a short time, Calvin counseled Knox to go to Frankfurt to pastor a, a, an English-speaking Marian exile church in Frankfurt. He did that for a while. There was a dispute over uh, the worship. Would they be more like Church of England with, high uh, uh, with, a, with a high formality in their worship? Or would they be of a different style? Knox withdrew. He came down to Geneva after a short trip back up to Scotland under the cover of night. And John Knox in Geneva now sits at the feet of Calvin. The truth is just pouring into John Knox. And John Knox in the auditoire across the street from the Saint Paris Cathedral is a part of the Bible translation team of translating the Bible into the English language that will become the Geneva Bible. You will see a Geneva Bible downstairs, 1560. John Knox is in the room in Geneva, a part of this translation work. He is a brilliant man, highly capable. In 1559, John Knox returns back to Scotland. Previous to his return, there has been a public trial and he has been declared a heretic, and he has been burned in efficacy. efficacy. He still goes. He's bold. He's courageous. And after he arrives, Bloody Mary is removed from the throne, and she flees to England, where she will be put to death. John Knox, now in 1560, is regarded as perhaps the greatest year in Scotland's history, John Knox helps establish the Church of Scotland. He's a part of writing their doctrinal statement, the Scots Confession. Uh, he's working with Parliament. He, he becomes the leading spiritual figure in Scotland, this great nation that will have three reformations, that will send missionaries out to the nations, uh, this great nation that will benefit from the, the public education system that will come up under Knox's own influence, and inventors and scientists and poets and writers and authors will come pouring out of Scotland, but it is all traced back to the Scottish Reformation and John Knox's spiritual leadership. Soon... Mary, Stu Mary Stuart, who will become Mary Queen of Scots, comes from France back to be the heir of the throne of Scotland. And you are no doubt aware of the famous confrontations between John Knox and Mary Stuart, Queen of Scotland. As she comes back, she comes back as a Roman Catholic. And she has conducts a private mass in Holyrood Palace. And John Knox is made aware of this. And from the pulpit of the historic St. Giles Church in Edinburgh on the Royal Mile, John Knox begins to preach against the Queen and her masses and says 
that one mass, just one mass, the idolatry of the Catholic mass, the blasphemy of the Catholic mass, just one mass is to be feared more than all of the marching armies of Europe were they to storm the island of Scotland and bring the false gospel and bring the, the idolatrous blasphemy of the corruption of the Roman church to this island. When she hears of this, she calls John Knox and has him summoned to Holyrood Palace where she is ready to dress him down for publicly calling him out and she will eventually put him on trial for treason. And as John Knox is in Holyrood Castle, one man against not only the queen, but she is surrounded by all of her advisors. He turns the tables on her and begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and calls her to repentance for her idolatry and reduces her to tears. And John Knox said she became like a howling animal that was wounded. She would eventually, through various political issues, abdicate the throne. And John Knox would continue to preach until extraordinary civil war-like pressure is building between those loyal to the queen and Catholicism, or the one-time queen and Catholicism, and the Protestant faith. And it becomes so tempestuous that John Knox literally has to leave town. And he goes to St. Andrews, remembering that he had always said, I know I will preach in St. Andrews again. He preaches the gospel there. Dr. Ferguson and I were just there three or four weeks ago. I could not resist mounting the pulpit and preaching. There, John Knox spent the last few years. He came down back to Edinburgh to end his life. The last time he stepped into the pulpit at St. Giles was to lay hands on his successor, James Lawson. I am Stephen James Lawson. John Knox then, a few days later, died. He is presently buried in the parking lot, covered over with asphalt in Edinburgh. Today he is not an esteemed figure. He is not an, an iconic hero to the common person. He is seen as someone who was a disruptor of the public peace. He was such a powerful, prolific figure that he was the man who led the charge to turn a nation around for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what was it about his preaching that God would so use to re... or not to reestablish, to establish for the first time a Protestant nation built upon the Word of God. I want to set before you in the time that I have left, that was the quickest fly over his life I could possibly do. I want to set before you several characteristics of his preaching. We only have two or three of his sermons. Calvin, huge number. Spurgeon, I have 63 volumes. Luther, I have 55 volumes. John Knox's works are six volumes, but within those six volumes, there's only two or three sermons. So what can we pull together from this about this 
power, powerful preacher that shook a nation. Number one, I'm going to put these in two words. Two words. He was God called and he knew it. I believe that a man must know that he is called by God to preach the Word of God because tough times will always come. How could anyone go through all that John Knox went through, and I did not even skim the, hardly the surface of all of the controversy, the conflict, the crisis that the man, the man lived under throughout the entirety of, of his ministry. There is only one way that you have staying power in the ministry at its very essence, and it is to believe that you have been divinely appointed from your mother's birth to preach the gospel of Christ. That there is one supreme reason why I'm on this earth to glorify God, and that is to be a mouthpiece for the Word of God to preach to others the truths of the gospel. And that was John Knox. And it goes all the way back to when he first was pointed out in public in the St. Andrew's Castle Chapel when a Protestant leader in the middle of the service said, This church calls you to be a preacher of the gospel. He was reduced to tears and ran out of the room and went back to his his room there to to pour over his soul. It was a a heart-searching time for John Knox. And when he emerged, he was confident that the hand of God was upon his life to preach. There would be other times in the future when he would be tempted to be pulled in other directions, not the least of which was when he was England, in England and so recognized by the king, and there was a great bishopry that was offered to him that would have taken him out of the pulpit and in essence moved him upstairs to a higher level in ecclesiastical circles where he would oversee other ministry, but he would no longer be preaching the Word, no longer blowing his master's trumpet. And John Knox made the astonishing decision that a decision that everyone else would have died to been able to, to accept, John Knox refused so that he could continue to preach the Word of God. He believed to do anything else would be a violation of God's sovereign choice and call for his life. I trust that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you have been singled out by God for the unique calling of blowing your master's trumpet. Second, He was a God-fearing man. He preached so strongly because he feared God so deeply. There was a reverential awe that gripped his soul for God that led him to be as bold as a lion. He faced opposition from every side. But he was so bold before men because he was so humble before God. And because he feared God so much, he feared no man. Knox said, what influenced me to utter whatever the Lord put into my mouth, so boldly, without respect of persons, was a reverential fear of my God, who called me and of His grace appointed me, to be a steward of divine mysteries in a belief that he will demand an account of the matter in which I have discharged the trust committed to me when I stand at last before his tribunal. He was a God-fearing man who knew one day he would give an account to his master of the stewardship that had been entrusted to him had he been faithful to discharge his duty. I want to remind all of us in this room that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And every man shall give an account to his master for his message, 
for his methods, and for his motives. And we will give an account to our fidelity in the Word. There's much more I'd like to say, but I I, I must press on. In fact, as I press on, let me just read one quote from Knox's encounter with Mary, Queen of Scots, with her sin of taking the, the secret mass in Holyrood Palace, and after she summoned him, Nick, uh, Knox responded to her and said, Madam, in God's presence I speak. In God's presence I speak. Now, that should be like a, a shadow that hangs over every one of us. In God's presence I speak. At the end of his life, November 17, 1572, Knox met with his colleagues as he lay on his deathbed. And he said, A certain reverential fear of my God. A certain reverential fear of my God who called me and was pleased of His grace to make me a steward of divine mysteries, to whom I knew I must render account when I shall appear before His tribunal of the manner in which I have discharged the stewardship which He committed to me had such a powerful effect as to make me utter so intrepidly whatever the the Lord put into my mouth. You see, he believed not only in sola scriptura, he believed in tota scriptura. Not only scripture only, but all of scripture. There was nothing withheld in John Knox's preaching. To the point that when they buried him outside of St. Giles Church in Edinburgh, the ambassador said... Here lies a man who feared no flesh. No wonder he's so powerful. Third, he was a text-driven preacher. He had a high view of preaching because he had such a high view of the Bible itself. He believed that the Bible is exactly what it claims to be. He could not but preach anything but the Bible. Knox said, For as the Word of God is the beginning of life, spiritual, without which all flesh is dead in God's presence. In other words, there is no spiritual life apart from the Word of God, the written Word of God received into the soul. It is the lantern to our feet. Without the brightness where all the posterity of Adam does walk in darkness. And it is the foundation of faith. Without which no man understands the good will of God. So it is also the only organ and instrument which God uses. It is the only organ and instrument which God uses to strengthen the weak, to comfort the afflicted, to reduce to mercy by repentance such as have backslidden, and finally to preserve and keep the very life of the soul in all assaults and temptations. And therefore, if you desire your knowledge to be increased, if you desire your faith to be confirmed, if you desire your consciences to be quietened and comforted, and finally, if you desire your soul to be preserved in life, Let your exercise be frequent in the law of God. He said the word of the living God was, is, and shall be sure and stable forever. The word of God cannot be false. I always contain my affirmations within the bounds of God's Scripture. In other words, the preacher has nothing to say apart from the word of God. Everything that we have to say is to flow from this fountain of truth, the Word of God. He was a text-driven preacher. 
Fourth, he was a sequential expositor. And then it's to say, for the most part, he was committed to preach through entire books of the Bible or extended uh, sections of them. He, can pre- he preached consecutively through Scripture. It was that way from the very beginning. When he first in St. Andrew's Castle began to teach the Scripture, he did so systematically and sequentially through the Gospel of John, and it would continue throughout his ministry, preaching even through large Old Testament prophetic books like Isaiah, as well as Daniel and Haggai. Now listen to this quote. Knox said, we like, uh, excuse me, we think it most expedient that the Scripture be read in order. And that is that some one book of the Old or New Testament be begun and orderly read to the end. And the same we judge of preaching, where the minister, for the most part, remains in one place, meaning one place in Scripture, and works his way from one place to the next in logical, sequential order. He says, skipping and deviating from one place to another in Scripture, be it read or preached, we judge not so profitable as the continual following of one text. He was a sequential expositor. There is the time and the place for the topical and the doctrinal exposition. There is time and play, or the time and the place to trace out great themes in the Bible. But the meat and potatoes, day in, day out, to be served to a flock, Knox believed was to be the consecutive exposition. Number five, he was a well-studied student. He possessed a brilliant mind. He was so powerful, sometimes we forget the fact that he was, he had a towering intellect. And it came out in the study, and it came out in the pulpit. And he believed that preaching demanded the best mental powers. And so he was well absorbed in the diligent study of the Word. He drew on his knowledge of the biblical languages, even though he entered the ministry so late in life. Uh, John Broadus, in his wonderful book, Lectures on the History of Preaching, writes, Knox was pressed into the ministry at the age of 42. About this time, he learned Greek. And at the age of 49, we find him at Geneva busily studying Hebrew. And we also read of him reading the leading theological writers and sitting at his books he makes mention of in his letters and and reading Christostom and some of the most godly expositions. He was well studied. He knew what he was talking about and he had a confidence when he preached. That's a part of being a powerful preacher. You have deep convictions. And number six, he had a plain interpretation of the Scripture. He, He writes in Scotland's first book of discipline, that the Scripture should be according to the plain reading or interpretation of the Scripture. Rome had allegorized. Rome had had turned the Word of God into a wax nose that could be twisted in any direction. Knox was committed to the plain reading or interpretation of the Scripture, and when he stood before Mary, Queen of Scots, she said to him, as he confronted her with her Catholic corruption of the Scripture, she said to him, you interpret the Scripture in one manner, and others interpret it in another manner. Who am I to believe? And who shall judge? To which Knox responded, Madam, you shall believe God, who plainly speaks in His Word, The Word of God is plain in itself. And if there appears any obscurity in one place, the Holy Ghost, who never contradicts Himself, explains the same more clearly in other places. 
The reformers called this the perpiscuity of Scripture, and they called it the analogy of faith. The perpiscuity of Scripture simply means that the Scripture is clear and lucid and is understandable in the essential truths that it presents in matters of salvation and holy living. Now, the Roman Catholic Church said, oh, no. You're not, you're not capable or qualified to read the Bible, so we're not going to translate it into your language. You're not capable of understanding it, so we're not even going to preach in your language. And the Reformers said, hogwash. Can God not communicate? And the Reformers brought the Word of God in its plain interpretation, showing what God meant by what God said. That was John Knox. He believed the Bible speaks with one voice, with one plan of salvation with one standard of morality, with one plan for the ages, with one design for the family, etc. Number seven, he was a Christ-centered preacher. And he had to be at this day, in time especially, he preached the person, the offices, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and preaching Christ was his highest aim. And it is said by one commentator of Knox's life, he, re he called the Scottish church to its original audience, to Christ, the church's head, not to the bishop of Rome. Knox's first book of discipline broke the tyranny thus established by Rome. In it, Christ alone was recognized as head of the church. That, in part, was the whole issue of the, the Reformation. Who is the head of the church? Is it the bishop of Rome, or is it the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth? And what comprises the church? Is it everyone who is just born into it, or is it everyone who is born again into it? Knox said, there is no name by which men can be saved but that of Jesus and that all reliance on the merits of others is vain and delusive. Referring to the merits of, 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 of saints or of, or of Mary or of the treasury of merit or the purchases of indulgences or, or last rites or, or any of these other seven sacraments. He says it's, it's vain and delusive that the Savior, having by His own sacrifice sanctified and reconciled to God those who should inherit the promised kingdom. All other sacrifices which men pretend to offer for sin are blasphemous. All men ought to hate sin which is so odious before God that no sacrifice but the death of His Son could satisfy for it. Even to the end of His life. His last sermon was on the crucifixion of Christ. And he became slightly disoriented, and, and, and when he was bedridden after that, and he pulled himself out of bed and began to dress himself to go to church, and it wasn't the Sabbath, but he knew he must preach on the resurrection of Christ. What a great way to end your life and your ministry, just pulling yourself out of bed to go preach the next sermon on Christ. Number eight, he was a sola fide preacher. Faith alone, in Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. Knox was firmly committed to the distinctives of the Reformation in his preaching. He was committed to all five of the solas. But those middle three that define the gospel, that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period, paragraph, was at the heart of his preaching. Uh, he preached justification by faith alone, the very material principle that involves the very substance of the gospel. When Knox preached his first sermon from Daniel chapter 7 back in St. Uh, 
Andrew's castle, the response from the very first sermon to come from his lips, they said, others lopped the branches of the papistry, he strikes at the root. Others are just dealing with the immorality of Rome, but Knox went after the juggler vein, he went after the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ and preached justification by faith alone. He did not trouble himself with peripheral issues. If therefore the doctrine of any man tend to the exaltation and advancement of any righteousness or perfection except of Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Sounds like Paul to me. Number nine. He was a sovereign grace preacher. Along with the other reformers, Knox believed and preached the absolute supreme authority and sovereignty of God over all things, over all matters of providence and salvation and judgment. Knox preached that God possesses divine right as the king of heaven over all the works of his hands. He believed in the doctrine of sovereign election, unconditional, free, electing love of God, setting his heart upon those who are unworthy and undeserving who would never come to him, but God is the initiator in eternity past choosing by himself and for himself those whom he will save and leaving the others to their just judgment. Knox said, as for our God, in his own nature he is immutable. So remains his love towards his elect is also always unchangeable. For as in Christ he has chosen his church before the beginning of all ages, so by him will he maintain and preserve the same unto the end. He believed that from ever, from eternity past to eternity future, it is all a sovereign grace. He was outspoken about this. When he, retur- when he returned to Scotland in 1550. Nine, the first treatise that he wrote is entitled A Treatise on Predestination. And he gives the reasons for the importance of preaching the doctrine of predestination. He writes, the doctrine of God's eternal predestination is so necessary to the church of God that without the same... Faith can neither be truly taught, neither be surely established. Man can never be brought to true humility and never be brought to the full knowledge of God himself. Neither can he be ravished in admiration of God's eternal goodness And man can never be moved to praise God as he should be praised apart from the doctrine of predestination. He understood what we must understand, that the doctrine of God's sovereign predestination is the great pride crusher. It is the great worship inspirer. And remove that and you move a linchpin out of the body of divinity that is to be taught to the church. Number ten, he was a polemic defender of the faith. Knox understood that it was his duty as a preacher not only to proclaim the truth, but to defend the truth from all attacks of errors. Now, this is what Titus 1 verse 9 says, that an elder must be able to teach in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. 
Not just smile at him and say, well, you know, we're all saying the same thing. To refute those who contradict sound doctrine. He was so polemic in this day of swirling Catholic monstrosities committed against the gospel of Christ that Luther spoke out so boldly that it almost singes the hair on the back of our neck to hear him preach so boldly. Almost distasteful today. Knox said that God's word damns your ceremonies. It is evident. For the plain and straight commandment of God is not that thing which appears good in your, in your eyes, but what the Lord your God has commanded that you are to do. Add nothing to the Scripture, diminish nothing within it. Now, unless you are able to prove that God has commanded your ceremonies, His former commandment will damn you. And it is true. John J. Murray, who writes a recent biography on John Knox, said his teaching contained a denial of the Pope as head of the church, terming him antichrist, and a rejection of any religion not based exclusively on the Bible. He declared the Mass to be an abomination, purgatory non existent, and prayers for the dead vanity and idolatry. He had to be strong in these days. He had to fight the good fight. Number 11, he was an extemporaneous preacher. And he desired a, a freedom in his delivery, so he chose to preach without a manuscript. He carried a few notes, but they were very limited. He wanted to have a spontaneous speech because he felt that gave him a more powerful delivery and expression. It is said by William Taylor, it was his habit to speak from a few notes which were made on the margin of his Bible. So that's how few notes he had. They were scribbled out in the margin of his Bible. And which remained the sole, meaning only, the sole written memorandum of his discourse. Yet his sermons were as carefully premeditated as if they had been written. He prepared with care and remembered with accuracy. He did not speak extemporaneously in the sense of never having thought upon his subject until he was required to speak, but he had fixed beforehand his line of thought, and there is reason to believe also, in many cases, the very words in which he had determined to express himself. Yet, though he premeditated very carefully, he was able also to introduce what was given to him at the moment. Meaning, as he stood in the pulpit, God would add to what he had premeditated. And he felt it led to a more prolific, powerful presentation of the truth. One of the few sermons that we have is on Christ's temptation in the wilderness from Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And as I was looking at it the other day, I noticed that at the end of his introduction, and this is very much like Spurgeon at the end of his introduction, he will give the headings of the sermon before he preaches through those headings. And what John Knox did, just to give us an idea of what he was doing, he used the, the, the adverbial outline, who, what, when, where, why, and how to work his way through the temptation of Christ. So he had structured thought and divisions and, and headings. He knew exactly where he was headed, but with a, a liberality and a freedom of speech that allowed him to give powerful utterance from the pulpit. And then finally about John Knox, number 12. <laughs> he had a passionate delivery. He was fiery in his delivery. He, he roared like a lion. 
John Knox writes, the Scottish preachers have as a rule been more fiery and more impassioned than the English preachers. William Taylor states, the pulpit was the magnifying glass for Knox. Have you ever, as a kid, taken a magnifying glass and gone out on a sunny day and hold it over a piece of paper, and as the sun comes through the magnifying glass, it all focuses down to a pinpoint with such heat that there becomes uh, ignited uh, on a piece of paper. It bursts into flames. And, and William Taylor says, that was Knox as he stood in the pulpit. It was as though a magnifying glass was being held over the Word of God and over his own soul, and there was uh, an ignition igniting that was taking place in the pulpit, which focused all of his powers to a point and quickened them into an intensity, which kindled everything it touched. It brightened his intellect. It enlivened his imagination. It, it clarified his judgments. It, it inflamed his courage and gave fiery energy to his utterances. There, over and above the fervid animation which he had in large measure and the glow of enthusiasm which fills the soul of the orator, he also had the feeling that he was called of God to be faithful and lifted him entirely out of himself. He spoke because he could not but speak. And his words went into men like modern missiles which burst within the wounds which they have made. So his words exploded within the hearts of those who received them and set them on fire with convictions that flamed forth in conduct. It was apparently impossible for anyone to listen to Knox without being moved either to antagonism or to agreement. Like one preacher said, after I preach, I want everyone to leave either mad, sad, or glad. But no one to be a bump on a log in a wax museum. That was, that was John Knox. Thomas McCry, his, his famous biographer, talks about this zeal in his preaching. His ministerial functions were discharged with the greatest fervor. He said he, de he delighted in preaching. It was like he came alive in the pulpit. So much so that even at the end of his life, in 1571, he died the next year, 1572. In 1571, he's in St. Andrews preaching, and a teenager named, named James Melville, a 15-year-old teenager is sitting there listening to Knox preach. Knox was an old man at the end of his life. Had to be helped up into the pulpit. Listen to what this teenage boy writes of Knox's preaching as he approaches 60. I heard Knox teach there the prophecies of Daniel that summer. And the winter following, I had my pen and my little book and took away such things as I could comprehend. In the opening up of his text, he was moderate for the space of half an hour. So he spent the first half hour just exegeting, excavating, opening up the meaning of the text, but... When he entered into application, he made me to shiver and tremble, such that I could not hold a pen to write. He was very weak. I, I saw him every day go slowly and warily, referring to on the streets of St. Andrews. I could see him walking down the street, he said, with a fur around his neck, a staff in one hand, and good Richard Ballantyne, his servant, holding up the other, would be other, under the other arm, holding him up, and Knox had this other staff 
as he's hobbling down the street from the abbey to the parish kirk, to the church. And by the time Richard and the other servant lifted him up to the pulpit, it took two to lift him up into the pulpit, it was necessary that he lean on it at his first entry, but before he was done with his sermon, he was so active and vigorous that he was likely to ding the pulpit into pieces as if he was flying out of it. That was the passion of John Knox's preaching. He wasn't up here lecturing. Lecturing is fine. Save it for the classroom. The pulpit is the place for preachers. And preachers ding the pulpit to blads. Knox said, God gave His Holy Spirit to simple men in great abundance. I think we qualify. Simple men, not many mighty, not many noble. God has chosen the base things of the world to confound the wise and the wicked. He's given His Holy Spirit to simple men in great abundance. When he first returned to Scotland, I close with this. The English ambassador, Thomas Randolph, sent a letter to the Secretary of State in England, William Cecil, October 1561, in which he describes Knox's preaching this way. I assure you, the voice of one man is able in one hour to put more life into us than 500 trumpets continually blustering in our ears. That is a spirit-filled, spirit-anointed, spirit-empowered, spirit-energized preacher of the Word of God that he can in one hour put more life into people than 500 trumpeters blaring their trumpets all day long. May God raise up in our midst simple men who have an abundant supply of the Holy Spirit, who will put their lips to the Word of God and stand on the wall where they are positioned and blow their master's trumpet. May you know that your God called. May you be God-fearing. May you be so text-driven. May you be sequential in your handling of the Scripture. May you be Christ-centered. May you plainly interpret the Word of God. May you be so passionate, and when necessary, be polemic and to refute those who contradict. And God will use you to bring about a great reformation in your church, in your community, in your city, perhaps even in your country and in your world.